want to talk today about the war for the third temple. We're getting very close to the time, and we need to be prepared for what's coming. Amen. Amen? And this is the most important thing in the world right now. And the war that's coming, and it is coming, has already begun. It's going to be about Ukraine. It's going to be about China. It's going to be about uh, Iran and Hezbollah and everything under the sun. But when it's all said and done, it's going to be about the temple. Amen. Because that's what God is doing right now. How many of you have heard of the millennium? You know what the millennium is? Uh, when Jesus comes, he's going to rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years. That's called the millennium. And uh, then when that's over with, we're going to have the eternal state where it's going to be, things are going to be settled forever. But the millennium is a period of time in which Christ will rule over the nations and Israel will be the head nation. And all of the things that the prophets have spoken will come to pass. And the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. 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 It's not going to happen the way a lot of Christians think it's going to happen. There's a whole, well, I'd say most of the church right now is caught up in this idea that we're going to bring in the kingdom. And nothing could be further from the truth. It's a lie. It's an absolute outright lie from Satan. It's a deception. God is bringing the kingdom. But he is bringing it through the king, who is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he is bringing his people back to himself. And when he has completed that, we're going to see his glory in the earth. Amen? All right. So who's going into the millennium? Well, hopefully we are. Now I say hopefully because it's really up to us in the long run that we stay faithful to God. Jesus has made the way. He's the one who has invited us. We are invited to be with him, to reign with him, to be his bride. Amen? Amen. But we have to love him. We have to respond to him. We have to stay with him. Amen. We have to be faithful. And don't believe the lie that once saved, always saved. That's absolute garbage. It's against everything in Scripture. We have to stay true to Him. And Jesus said, if you don't take up your cross daily and walk with Him, you're not worthy of Him. But what that means is you have to love Him enough. It has to be important to you. Amen? So who wants to rule and reign with Jesus? Who wants to be with Him when He comes? That's the bride of Christ. And I, I think we're beginning to understand more and more what an incredible call that is. Yeah. That's not just a call to go to heaven. Mm. It's an incredible call to be specially his people, to be specially connected to the Messiah for all eternity. Amen. To be his... The bride thing is not an analogy, it's real. Yep. We really are his bride, Amen. his very special people. We are going to be like him. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things, right? And through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Amen. That's you. He's bringing us to glory. He's not going to leave you the way you are. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. But he's going to change us. We're going to be like him. And he is a new creation. He is God, 100% God, yet he's 100% man and he's glorified body. And, and that's the way we're going to be, glorified to be with him. And John says, we don't really understand what we're going to be like, but we're going to be like him. Amen. Because we're going to see him face to face. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he be gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Beloved, now we are children of God, and has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, and we will be with him. Because we will see him just as he is. So you have to understand that our call is, the call on Israel is not the same call that we have. 
And this is where a lot of people mix it up. Israel is different than the church. That's God's wisdom. They have a national call. They have an earthly call. We do not. We have a heavenly call. We have an upward call. We have a call to be with Christ in the heavenlies, to reign with him on earth. Yes, we're going to be on the earth, but that's kind of going to be like where we work. Okay? Because he's preparing a place. That's what he said. I'm preparing a place. I believe that place is the new Jerusalem that's going to come down out of heaven. But that's another whole message. Anyway, who's going to be there? Well, the bride, number one, the, along with the Messiah, of course. Then we have the tribulation saints. That's all the people who come to Christ during the tribulation period. And they're all going to be martyred for their faith. I think it's becoming more and more clear as we study it that that's going to be uh, unanimous. That those who make it through that time and come to Christ and walk with Christ are going to suffer for their faith and are going to be martyred. Right? And they're going to be resurrected and they're going to be there as well. And then we're going to have all the old covenant saints. We're going to have Daniel. We're going to have Moses. He's already there, isn't he? He's going to be there in bodily form as well. See, we don't realize that your body is really important to God. He's transformed it. He's going to transform it into a body of his glory. He's going to transform it into a spiritual body. It's still going to be your body, but it's going to get such an incredible makeover. <laughs> and I'm getting excited about that. How about you? This is real. This is not just, oh, yeah, we're going to be resurrected. This is real. You have to get that this is real. And we're going to have a, a new power source. It's not going to be blood anymore. It's not going to be oxygen. It's going to be the light of God. That's why we get eternal life. The people who go into the millennium uh, that's going to be Israel, the nation, and the nations of the earth that go into the millennium are mortal people. They don't have eternal life. That's something to think about, right? But we have been sold this bill of goods about heaven that everybody is just kind of the same, and it's a whole communist view of heaven. Heaven is not communist. God has created incredible diversity in this age, and what is it going to be like in the age to come? There'll be, uh, Paul said, the glory of the stars and the glory of the moon and glory of sun and each star differs from one another in glory. And so it will be at the resurrection. The nations, there are going to be people who are going to come through the tribulation, not take the mark of the beast and enter into the millennial kingdom. There we find them in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. They're the sheep. And they are allowed into the millennium, and they will populate the earth and create nations again. Amen? And God is always going to have nations. In the final state, there are going to be nations as well. Amen? And somebody took issue with me on that one day, and I said, well, it says we're going to rule over the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. The grace people don't like that verse. But if, if we're going to rule over nations, there have to be nations. Amen. That's just common sense, right? So the other so thing is that there is a temple in the millennium. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of Christians don't want to hear about the temple. You know, they, to them, the temple was something that God kind of had a bad day when he created that. That's how they think. It's like, oh, that temple and all those sacrifices and all that, that was... That's all, you know, Jesus hated all that, somebody said to me. But the church is going to go through an incredible awakening with regard to the temple. It is going to shake up, it's going to be a war inside the church. And Christians that we know and love are going to freak out, as we say, at the idea of God building the temple. And now people who know that it has to be rebuilt for the scriptures to be fulfilled are already calling it the Antichrist temple. But the Bible says that he takes his seat in the temple of God. 
And Jesus called it the holy place. So it's still the holy place, even though there's an abomination on it. Amen? Amen. Now, uh, the other thing you may not realize, there's going to be a temple in the millennium, and Ezekiel laid it all out. You can check it all out from chapter, I think it's 46, right on through 47, 48. The, The millennial temple. And it is going to be huge. And Jeru- it's, uh, the whole topography is going to change in Jerusalem. And the mountain of, of the house of the Lord is going to be raised up above all the mountains. And all the earth is going to come up to it to worship God. Amen? Amen. Now here's something that you might not think about too much. But uh, the gospel of the kingdom is not preached in the age to come. It's preached now. Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. And when the end comes, there'll be no more preaching the gospel. So now is the time to accept the gospel. Those who don't accept it are going to forever lose it and suffer the consequences. But that answers the question of why in the age to come is our people not getting saved the way we do. Because they don't have the same offer that you have. So really, you need to really, this makes this the most incredible time to live. Amen. And you know, God picks all of us, uh, picks for us all of us the time that we live. And the opportunities that we have. So we really need to take them seriously. Amen. Amen. Now it will come about, this is Isaiah chapter 2, that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord. The mountain, the mountain is Mount Moriah, but it's the mountain of the house. The house is the temple. How can anyone say that it's the church? But they do. This is what replacement theology tells people, that's the church. That's not the church. That's the mountain of the house of the Lord. There is no mention of the church in the Old Old Testament. That was a mystery, Paul said, that was not revealed to the prophets. Isaiah wasn't speaking about the church. He's speaking about the mountain, the temple mount in Jerusalem. Amen? Amen? It will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised upon the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the house, mountain of the house of the Lord, to the, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that he may teach us about his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and he will judge between the nations and will mediate for many peoples and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up a sword against nation and never again will they learn war. So this is clearly the millennium. All right, not something that was fulfilled already. This is future. And my servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and follow them and they will live on the land that I gave my servant Jacob in which your fathers lived and they will live on it they and their sons and their sons sons forever and my servant David will be their leader forever and I will make a covenant of peace with them it will be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them And I will place them and multiply them, and listen to this, and set my sanctuary among them in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, and the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Now, We know that during the millennium, the the temple is going to be in the midst of the nations, on the mountain of the house of the Lord, and all of the nations will go up there to worship. And they will learn the ways of God, and they will learn all about the blood, and all about what the blood does, and all about coming close to God, and all about their sins, and how God has uh, given us the opportunity to be restored and be redeemed. And they'll be learning that, walking in that for a thousand years. And then will come the final state 
where the sanctuary of God will still be among his people, will be in the center of the earth, and it will be just absolutely incredible. I'm going to read you another verse from Revelation chapter 3. And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as also I have received authority from my Father. So we are going to sit with him and rule with him. Amen? There's, if you want a verse on it, it's right there. We're given the throne with him. And maybe, you know, that's a serious call. Now, this is one you probably don't realize, that the Levitical priesthood will be restored. Because we are so conditioned to think about the, the Melchizedek priesthood. Well, the Melchizedek, we are part of the Melchizedek priesthood because Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, right? And uh, that simply means that the king, the kingship and the, and the priesthood are joined together in Messiah. He's both king and priest. But God in his wisdom in the old covenant kept the, the Levitical priesthood separate from the kingship, from ruling. Amen? But Jesus has combined the two offices and brought them together. So they're two different priesthoods. But the Levitical priesthood is not done away with. It's coming back for the millennium period. See, the church hates that talk. They would consider this like most places wouldn't even allow this to be preached. But this is what's coming, and this is why this is going to be a major shakeup. This is what the Lord says. David shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall not lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night do not occur at the proper time, Then my covenant with David, my servant, may be also broken, so that uh, he will not have a son to reign on his throne. Does David have a son to reign on his throne? And with the Levitical priests, my ministers, as the heavenly lights cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of my servant David and the Levites who serve me. So there's... There it is right there in black and white. Then say to him, the Lord of armies says this, Behold, there is a man whose name is Branch, and he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. This is the messianic promise. The Messiah will build the temple. How do those who say that we don't need a temple, what do they do with that verse? Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he who will bear the the majesty and sit and rule on his throne. So he will be a priest on his throne. See, it's the the Melchizedek priesthood. And the council of peace will be between the two offices, both the king and the priest. Amen? And this this verse you all know from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people, 70 periods of seven, right? We have taught that over and over. Those are the 77s, right? And we know that uh, 69 of them came, were fulfilled when the Messiah was crucified and cut off and rejected by his nation. And there's one left hanging out there, one seven-year period, which is we call Daniel's 70th week. And right in the middle of it is the abomination And the tribulation begins. The tribulation is not seven years long. It's three and a half years long. And the confusion caused by the seven years is just, it is causing confusion everywhere. And blinding us to the obvious. But look at what it says the Messiah is going to do, right? Uh, Decreed for your people, that's the Jewish people, and your holy city. What holy city is that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right? to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity. You see, there's the work of the Messiah. Who made atonement? To bring in everlasting righteousness. Who does that? That's the Messiah. 
to seal up vision and prophecy? Well, that's because it's all fulfilled. He seals it up, right? We don't need vision and prophecy after the millennium comes. It's done away with. It's all fulfilled. And look at the last one that nobody ever mentions, and to anoint the most holy place. The Messiah is going to anoint the holy place in Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the reason he has to rebuild it is because uh, during the earthquake, it's probably going to be torn down. And besides, the new one is going to be Ezekiel's temple, which is way bigger. Now, we're looking at the eternal state here briefly. Nations come to the new Jerusalem in the final state. And there's no temple that says the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now, do you know why there's no temple? Because it says it has no need of a temple. The Lamb and God Almighty are its temple. God dwells among people. They can come to God just like that without a temple because God has made the way. So why is there a, a temple in the millennium then? It's obvious because there's a need of it. Now, that's a bit of a mystery, so we won't go deeply into that today because we get lost. But what I want to share with you today is that the temple in Jerusalem is about to be rebuilt. It's going to happen. It's the next big event in prophecy. The next big event in prophecy is not the rapture. We know the rapture can't come until the, the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Right? Right? And that happens in the middle of the week. But what is coming next is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, yes. the third temple. Now, it's going to be, a, like I said, a huge stumbling block for a lot of Christians. It's interesting. In the first century, the Jews stumbled over the Gentiles. They stumbled over the Messiah giving his life because they were expecting him to come and rule and reign. But instead, he was a suffering servant, which they didn't see. And he died to bring Gentiles in to the promise. Amen. Amen? Amen? But at the end of the age, it's going to be reversed. We're the ones who are in danger of stumbling over Israel. Yes. The Gentiles are going to stumble over Israel. Why do you think, in all the stuff that's going on in the earth, that people are talking about this little mountain in Jerusalem? Yes. Or the devil knows his time is short, yep. and there's a war over the Temple Mount. And it's a global war. It will be built as a result of great war and conflict, and it will bring us to the peace deal that we all know is coming. God promised to scatter Israel to all the nations, and he fulfilled that promise in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, and the people were scattered and taken captive, and they were murdered, right? And then eventually, uh, 135 AD, we had another revolt, and Jerusalem was leveled and rebuilt into a pagan city, and the Jews were pretty much chased out of there and are only allowed to come back once a year for prayer. Yeah. Okay? And so Jewish people were scattered to the nations. But everybody accepts that. All the big names accept that. But what they don't accept is the second part of it, is God promised to bring them all back again. And in, in Ezekiel um, chapter 36, we're given this two-stage restoration. Yes. Stage one is, I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. That's stage one. It's like, it's not conditional. God says, I am going to take you from all the nations and bring you back to your own land, Amen. period. Not if you this or that, it's I'm going to do it. Has he done it? Yes. He's brought him back in the last century. In 1967, they were reunited with the old city of Jerusalem, the biblical city, which I believe was the end of the physical restoration. And since then, we've been working on the second part. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. That's the part we're working on now. Not we, but him. He is. 
I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave to your forefathers, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. So you see there's a two-stage, and we're in the second part. Uh, the physical restoration took 70 years. 70 years, one generation. A generation is 70 years. So 1897, uh, there was a declaration by a man named Theodore Herzl. He wrote the book called The Jewish State, founded the World Zionist Congress. It was the beginning of the physical restoration of Israel. It was finished in 1967, 70 years later. And the reason I say not 48, although 48 was the beginning of the nation, 67 was the reuniting with the city. So until the people, the city, and the holy place are together, it's not fulfilled. You understand? That's why the people are together in the land. They're reunited with the city they have sovereignty over the holy place, but they are not reunited with it. Yes. Yet. Yes. That's the next part of the prophecy. Amen. And this is where we Gentiles and Gentile believers don't get it at all. So hopefully, maybe some of that will come clear to you today. So I'm going to dispense with that now because the physical restoration has already taken place. But since 1967, when they took the old city of Jerusalem, then the, the spiritual restoration, the part where he says, I will bring you back to myself. I will put a new spirit in you. I will restore you into relationship with God, right? That part started in 1967. But we couldn't see it because it wasn't along the way we thought. We thought they were all going to get saved or something. We thought they were going to hear a gospel invitation and all get saved. But that's not how the nation of Israel comes back to God. Do they come to the Messiah? Yes, they will come to the Messiah, but not the same way you do, because they have a different promise, a different call. That's hard for people to accept, but it's true, and we have to accept it. The temple was and is central to Judaism. This is what we don't get. It's not just about sacrifices. It was central to biblical life. The, it would, the whole, all of their justice system was, was all uh, uh, carried out in the temple. The Levitical priests were part of the whole justice system. They taught the law, and then the rulers had to interpret the law the way they taught it. It wasn't just about sacrifices. It was the place to fellowship with God. It was the place where the nation came to fellowship with God. It was all about keeping Torah, worshiping together, the feasts, and so on. So we can say with, with all certainty that biblical Judaism needs the temple. After the destruction of the temple, the rabbis uh, hurriedly got together and tried to modify Judaism to keep it alive. And they took out things that they knew without the temple that could not be fulfilled, so they had to change them to something else. For instance, sacrifices became good works and so on. And it's another, another big mess up because those two things don't go together. The sacrifice shows that we need help. But if, we, if our good works can establish us, then that's the old sin. Trusting in their own efforts to be saved. Right? Which is where they are today. But that's all about to change. Now, let's say... If you're Jewish and you believe in biblical Judaism, then the temple has to be rebuilt. Now, let, look at this verse here in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince. Many days. It was actually many years. Without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household goods. God, excuse me, afterward, the children of Israel. Notice that afterward. So they're going to live a long time without the priesthood, without uh, sacrifices. But afterward, that implies that the sacrifices will be restored. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. There it is. 
But they're coming back, do you see they're coming back to the system they were taught and trained in. They're coming back to the temple. They're coming back to God in the way they know they're supposed to. I think that one makes it clear. But we could find others. But I don't have time. So 1967, the spiritual restoration began. This is where you should get great encouragement today. This is really fantastic. It's happening before our eyes. The movement uh, of the Temple Mount Faithful was established in 1967, right after the war. Now, um, the guy who gave it up, Moshe Dayan, who the guy with the big patch, I forget which eye he had it on, but uh, he was a secular guy, and the leaders of Israel, the nation at its founding, were secular. They were not religious Jews, and so they didn't see the problem, and they just kind of let it go. They took sovereignty over, but let the Muslims rule the mount. Yeah. And it's been that way ever since, but we can say that that was a, a terrible move, but that we leave that with God, but Israel was in no way ready to rebuild the temple. Yeah. Now we're learning that. It took, it's taken them all this time to prepare. So uh, they started with marches and and they were basically as prophets calling the nation back to rebuild the temple, just like the biblical prophets. They were saying, we need to do it, we need to do it. And they were marching and they created a cornerstone and all that. But the group splintered and in 1987, 20 years later, that's that 20 year period again, that comes through all of Israel's history. Um, the Temple Institute was established, right? And the Temple Institute began the serious work of preparation for the building of the temple. So they've been coming back to God all along. We just didn't see it. Now, of course, it's not everybody, but it's the, the people who, are, who want God. It's the Israelis, the, the religious people, the ones that, you know, give us a hard time. But that's because they really do. They really are serious about their faith. Amen. So it has good and bad for us. They are enemies for the gospel, but yet they are... Beloved because of the fathers. Amen. Amen. Amen? So it's a mixed bag for us Christians. But we need to appreciate what God is doing and bringing the nation back to himself. And we have a role to play in that. Amen. Preparing for the day when they come to Messiah. Amen. First they're going to receive the Antichrist. Yes. And then they're going to come with brokenness and repentance and cry out to him whom they have pierced. And mourn for him like one mourns for an only son. So then uh, in 1987, they built, they, they worked on the menorah. They had all these priestly garments to, to make, and they didn't have a clue. They had to study uh, Torah. They had to study the Mishnah. They had to go back and find all of the information they could find on how these things were made. Because they wanted to follow scripture clearly. And they had to get snails and get certain colors from snails. And they had to go all over the world to find some of the stuff that they couldn't find in Israel because of all of the destruction. And to sum it all up, what, what happened in 2017? Something big happened because it was a jubilee. God raised up an American president to declare that Jerusalem belonged to the Jewish people. That declaration shook things in the heavenlies and on earth. They went crazy. But it has stood. And the American embassy is still in Jerusalem. Now, it was of great importance because God was basically declaring to the nations that he has given Jerusalem to Israel. Amen? Amen? Now, they're going to fight that tooth and nail, and there's going to be a major war fought over it. But it will stand, and the temple will emerge from the rubble, and you and I are going to see it. And when you see that temple, boy, you better get excited. You're going to either get excited or be filled with fear, because it's proof that the Messiah is coming very soon. Anyway, uh, you can do the math. If 1967 was the beginning of the spiritual restoration, then 2037 is likely, and I put question marks there because I'm not saying thus says the Lord, but it's likely to be the fulfillment, the year when the millennium begins. 
And there are other prophecies which I have talked about many times uh, that, that clearly make the same case. So we are close. Right now, everything is in place. After painstaking work, and you can see all these things they have made, all the utensils for the temple, all of the, the garments, all of all, everything, the menorah, the, the, the table for the bread, all of it is made. And now, the final piece, the red heifer. They needed the red heifer, a perfect red heifer of the right age, to, to, uh, for the ashes of the heifer has to be cleanse the whole area so they can go up there and rebuild. Now, how is it going to work? You say, well, the Dome of the Rock is there. Well, let me just, let me just refresh your memory. Go back 100 years, and there was no nation of Israel. An old world thought they'd never be a, a nation of Israel ever again. Did God do it? Okay. God likes to do the impossible right before our eyes. 1950, 1960, the old city of Jerusalem was solidly under uh, Jordanian control, and they were never going to let Israel in there. And uh, they had, it, nobody was even thinking about it. There was barbed wire fences all around. It was kind of like the Berlin Wall. And in 1967, just like that, it was all torn down, and the city came back into Jewish hands. Well, it's just going to be just like that. God's going to do it. Amen? Well, it's going to take a war to do it, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But anyway, let's look at this. The red heifer is back, right? And they're all excited now because even, even the skeptics are realizing something's up because Israel has a perfect red heifer. Uh, by Passover of this coming year, 2024, they'll be ready to do the ceremony. It could take place next year. Wow. That soon. That soon. They're ready. It's of age. It's perfect. And even the Arabs are taking notice. Why isn't the church taking notice? But they're angry about it because they know the implication. All right, so here we go, guys. Every piece is in place except the temple. Do you think God has led them through all this and now we're not, he's not going to build the temple? They're not going to build the temple? It's coming. And you can absolutely take that, well... Take nothing to the bank anymore. <laughs> you can take that to your, you know, safe place, wherever it is. It's going to happen. Amen? So, here's the deal. Whenever Israel, or the plan of God, I should say, the purpose of God for Israel was at an impasse in World War I, Israel, Herzl went all over, he went to the Ottoman Turks, and he pleaded with them to give them uh, just a piece of land in, in what, biblical Israel, and they wouldn't do it. And he went there three times, and they said no. And then God uh, raised up World War I, and we can look at all the reasons why World War I happened, but God is the one that caused World War I to happen. I don't know what that does to your theology, but he's in charge and he's in control. And I don't care what a certain group in California say. He's in control. World War I, the Ottoman Turks were defeated. They lost control of the Holy Land, and the Brits were given the British mandate to create a state for Israel. By the nations. And those who say that Israel took the land back, which they had the right to do, but they didn't. It was given to them by the nations. And the impasse was ended. And God, the people of Israel were given an opportunity to come back to the land. Then they were at another impasse in 1940s, right? 1930s. Herzl was pleading with them to come back, and so were all the people that went out with him. Uh, from the Zionist movement, saying, we need help. We want to build the kibbutz and rebuild the land and clean it up and, and uh, you know, get established. And the people, in, the Jews in Europe did not want to hear it. They were more concerned about their way of life and making money and all that, kind of like Christians are today. Uh, and they ignored Herzl and they ignored the Zionist movement. And then the Lord, just as he said in Jeremiah 16, he first sent the fishermen, and then he sent the hunters. 
He said, I will hunt you out of every rock and every cave and every crag of the cliffs and bring you back to your land. And the Nazis came as the hunters. And the people of Israel had nowhere to go but back to Israel. And 1948, the result of World War II was the establishment of the state of Israel. And the result of the next one is going to be the building of the temple. Right? Because we're in an impasse again. All the, Israel is ready to build a temple and all, the, all the, the liberals and all the globalists and all the nations are saying, no way. And all the liberals in Israel are saying, no way. How many of you notice there's, there's a problem now? Because the religious in Israel have become the majority. And the, the ones who ruled the land for so long, the, the liberal ones who are really globalists and not, don't share any of this vision. They're being defeated, and now there's potential civil war going on. Pretty much like the same situation we have here, because we're dealing with a lot of the same people. So, folks, it's coming really close. Things are changing. What what the picture you're looking at right there is that in uh, uh, Tisha B'Av, the great day of mourning for the Jewish people, uh, 1,700 people, Jews, went up on the Temple Mount and walked around it. And prayed. Now, what you don't know is that they haven't been allowed to do this for a long time by their own police, by their own government. But but they weren't doing it, and they weren't even trying to. But that number has grown in the last few years to the point now where thousands are literally going up and insisting on going up. So things are changing radically. This is, issue is on the front burner now in Israel. And a, uh, uh, one of the members of, of the Knesset recently called for the Temple Mount to be divided. And we know, of course, according to Revelation 11, that's exactly what happens. So here's my, here's my prediction. The war that's coming will deal with the radicals who reject the Temple. It will deal with the radical uh, terrorists, Hezbollah, Hamas, all those who fight this. And we're going to see the same kind of situation what happened in, in Dubai where they built a temple and a mosque and a church all in the same place. Now, we're not saying that's good, that's bad. But it proves that these so-called moderate Muslims were okay with that. And that's what's going to happen again. The mosque... Uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque will stay there, but the Dome of the Rock will somehow come down. And it's going to happen, I guarantee it, because that is the holy place. Yes. Regardless of what Mr. Kanuki says. Yeah. All right, I'm going to play you a short video, and then we're going to wrap this up, all right? Those are the plans. They have the blueprints. They're ready to go. Amen? And it's going to happen. Just as sure as you're sitting in that seat, it's going to happen. Well, I want to show you this chart. You've seen that how the Lord restoring the church and restoring Israel together simultaneously, right? Two different calls, yet our destinies go to the same place. And uh, we see now that we're coming near the end of that. But look in the middle, you see we have a false church emerging, uh, riding the beast, the beast system, right? Maybe you know there's a harlot church out there. And it's made up of a lot of people we didn't think were ever going to be in it. 
So I think it's even the whole charismatic movement at this point, we have to say, come out of her, my people. Come out of that. Because you're not going to bring peace on your own. It's going to take the Prince of Peace to bring peace to this earth. Amen? But there's a great sifting taking place. In Israel, among us, the remnant, we're both remnants. The remnant of Israel, remnant nation, the remnant of the church is the bride of Christ. And there's a great sifting going on currently. How many of you would agree with that? Yes. People are being sifted as to what they believe. And I believe the next big wave that's coming is going to bring a fear of God. Amen. The one thing the church no longer has is fear of God. Amen. And that's what it's going to take for us to get ready for the days that are coming. Let's stand up. The Lord says that he's going to bring all the nations down against Jerusalem. So everything you see going on in the nations, especially this one, in all the superpowers around the world, what you see going on is the work of God bringing us to the, the very end. Now when I say it's God's work, the nations are rebelled against God a long time ago, right? The nations have their plan, but God is using all that to establish his plan. So... Don't be discouraged at what you see going on around you. Don't be discouraged as we see our nation collapsing. Because God has a plan that he's going to bring together and it will far surpass anything that we have ever seen before. Amen? So be encouraged today. Be excited. Keep your eyes on him, not on what the devil is doing. That doesn't mean we don't inform ourselves, but we keep our eyes on what God is doing because that is where you're going to find hope and encouragement. And the hope, folks, our hope is that Jesus is coming for us. He's coming for us. Our hope is the rapture. Recently, somebody told me, a pastor said to him, he asked him, what do you feel about the coming of Jesus? He said, oh, we can't, we can't talk about that people need to have hope. So the coming of Jesus to a lot of church people isn't hope, but that is our hope. Amen. So folks, let's keep our eyes on what he's doing. Amen.